So in this video, we'll be going over the ballistic pendulum example. And so the gist of a ballistic pendulum is that you fire a bullet into some object. That object is able to swing freely. And then the bullet embeds itself in the object and the object and the bullet swing up until they reach a maximum height and then you record what that height is. And so there's basically two parts to this ballistic pendulum. There's the first part of when the bullet is being shot into the object. And then there's the second part of when they are together, the bullet and the object, and they're swinging up to, to their maximum height. So it's pretty natural to split the ballistic pendulum example into two parts. The first part is what we've been dealing with recently. A bullet's being fired at some target and we are using conservation of momentum to understand the situation. What's happening before, what's happening after, since momentum has to be conserved. And now we're adding in another part. So this other part is what we've dealt with in the previous module, which is conservation of energy. So here we have, you can almost think of this as just a pendulum. If you were to just have something hanging down on a string and it swings up to some height, that's exactly what's going on here, is you have some object, it's swinging up to some height, so it's losing its kinetic energy, and that's being transferred into potential energy until it reaches its maximum height where we know the velocity is zero, so the kinetic energy must be zero. So in other words, we are transforming our kinetic energy entirely into potential energy. And so it's actually pretty neat. I mean, you got to think about this, this guy, Benjamin Robbins, he came up with this where he saw a need where he wanted to be able to measure the speed of a bullet. And he, he just exploited the physics principles to be able to, to do that. You know, he didn't have all the technology that we have now with cameras and everything to be able to, to slow down and find other ways of measuring the speed of the bullet. But here he's just indirectly measuring other quantities and then being able to backtrack and ultimately get what the velocity was of the bullet. So the first part of what we were asked to do was to define our problem solving steps so that we could give them to a classmate and they could, they could solve this problem. So you want to make sure that they are detailed. So the first step that I have is to define a coordinate system where up and to the right are positive. Remember, momentum's a vector. We're going to be solving for velocity, which is a vector. So we're going to need a coordinate system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose up to be positive y, to the right, to be positive x. And then the next step is to draw a diagram to be able to visualize the problem. And so you want to draw the diagram so that, again, it's separated into these two parts. It's all one motion, but in terms of a problem solving steps, you want to split it up into two parts and deal with them separately. So the next steps are determining what physics principles are at play for scenario one and scenario two. In scenario one, we've already talked about it. That's conservation of momentum, which is what we've, which is what we've been dealing with in this module. And then the second one, again, it's a review from the previous module where we're using conservation of energy. So then you'll be able to solve for 
the velocity of the bullet and the block using conservation of momentum. And now that can be written in terms of the velocity of the bullet. And so the first step is, is solved at that point. Now we would move on to the second part. And that's where we're in step five now. And so again, with conservation of energy, we need to ask ourselves what forces are acting in this system. Because remember, for conservation of energy, we need to take into account and figure out if there's work done by non-conservative forces. So drawing a free body diagram and then drawing a work diagram to figure out if there's work done by non-conservative forces. Gravity is a conservative force, but you have tension in the string or the cord or the cable, whatever you want to call that, that's attached to the block, making it rotate in an arc. What you're going to find is that Tension is a non-conservative force, but it's perpendicular to the direction. So there is no work done by non-conservative forces. So we can take the kinetic energy at the start. That gets transferred into potential energy completely. And we can solve for the kinetic energy at the start in terms of the maximum height. And then finally, we can backtrack and we can solve for the velocity of the bullet in terms of the height that the system reaches and the masses. So now that we've outlined the steps, we can implement them. The first part is what we're gonna deal with to start. And so this is just a conservation of momentum problem that we've dealt with in the past. The Initial velocity of the bullet is unknown. That's actually what we're looking for in the end. The mass of the bullet is 0.01 kilograms. The mass of the block of wood is 3 kilograms. The bullet embeds itself in the block after the collision. And so this is actually an important point that I missed in my problem solving steps. Talking about what kind of collision do we have. That's something that you're going to want to include. Do we have an elastic collision? Do we have an inelastic collision? Do we have a perfectly inelastic collision? Since the bullet embeds itself in the block, we have a perfectly inelastic collision. And that's really important because that dictates how we treat our momentum equation. And so, you can think about it as if these two things are sticking together. Like if you had two cars that run into each other and they stick together, you know that's a perfectly inelastic collision. Same sort of thing applies here where the bullet is sticking to the block. Now for the second part, we are dealing with a conservation of energy portion. And so what do we always do with conservation of energy when we're dealing with changes in height? We need to define where our potential energy, gravitational potential energy, is zero. And so I'm going to make it this convenient dashed line. We have the height that the block and bullet reach is 4.3 centimeters. And then their initial velocity, which we don't know, of the block and the bullet. But that's actually what we're going to be solving for in part one. So let's come down. Let's plan, plan our problem. So we have, for the first part, we have conservation of momentum again. That equation looks familiar. And then for the second part, we have conservation of energy. And that's our seven-term energy equation. So we can, again, just start with the first part. We have a completely inelastic or a perfectly inelastic collision. So we know that the velocity, final velocity of the bullet and the block are going to be the same because they're embedded. They are conjoined together. So we have the 
initial velocity of the bullet times the mass of the bullet is equal to the combined mass of the bullet and the block of wood times their final velocity. And then we just write the final velocity, their, their combined final velocity in terms of their masses and the velocity of the bullet. Because remember, we're ultimately looking for the velocity of the bullet. So here's our scenario for part two of where the block's swinging up. And what we need to do is we need to draw a free body diagram at this point to see what the determine what the forces are acting on this block bullet system. So we know we've got a weight force pointing downwards, weight, and then we have a tension force from the string or cable acting inwards towards the center of the circle. So again, we're in this circular path. So we know that the centripetal direction, that is the direction that the tension force is pointing, is going to be perpendicular to the direction of the velocity. So now we need to draw our displacement vector. And that displacement vector is along this arc path. And that displacement vector is pointing in the direction of the tangential velocity. And so we know that the angle between these two vectors is 90 degrees. So let's come down and let's draw our, our force diagram. We have tension pointing inwards here. We've got D going along the arc and the angle between them is 90 degrees. So the work is equal to the tension, magnitude of the tension times the magnitude of the displacement times cosine of the angle between them, which is 90 degrees. So the work done by tension is zero. So even though tension is a non-conservative force, the work done by non-conservative forces is zero. Because the only other force acting in this scenario is the weight force. The weight force we know is a conservative force. The force of gravity is a conservative force. So we don't have to deal with the work done by non-conservative forces because there is none. So now that we've looked at the work done by non-conservative forces, we can start to simplify our energy equation. So we know that at the start, the potential gravitational potential energy is zero because that's where we've defined the zero point to be. So we just have initial kinetic energy at the start because we already dealt with the work done by non-conservative forces, finding that that's zero. At the end, we're left with, we know we're going to have a gravitational potential energy at the end because we're reaching some height above our zero point. What about the final kinetic energy? Do we know anything about that? Well, we're reaching a maximum height. And what's that code word for? When we're at our maximum height, that means our velocity is zero. So if our velocity is zero, that means our kinetic energy at the top must be zero. So we find out that all of our kinetic energy is being transferred into potential energy. So we can substitute in, we're left with one half the mass of the bullet plus the mass of the block of wood times the combined velocity squared is equal to the mass of the bullet plus the mass of the wood times g times the height that they reach. Solving for the velocity, we find that that's just equal to the square root of 2g times h. So we're almost there. We're going to use the expression we have from the first part. We're going to substitute that in, and we're going to solve for the bullet's final velocity. So substituting that in and solving for the bullet's velocity, we get 1 plus the mass of the wood divided by the mass of the bullet times root 2gh.
Substituting our values in, we find the velocity of the bullet is 276 meters per second.